Amen. So we're continuing in the book of Hebrews. Um, in, we are in chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better." Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. All right, so this story of Melchizedek is derived from the Genesis account. Um, there's only three books in the Bible that mention Melchizedek. It's um, once here. It's here in Hebrews, um, it's in Psalms and in Genesis. So in Genesis 14, eight through, 18 through 20, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So who is this? Melchizedek lived during Abraham's time um, after God called Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, right? He finds himself in a situation. Abraham's uh, nephew Lot has been kidnapped. You know who Lot is the one that dwelt in Sodom. Remember this guy, right? Remember Lot's wife? This is that Lot. So Lot was kidnapped. And this king is uh, Sharda. I can never pronounce it. It's Shador Lamar or whatever. I don't know. C-H-E-D, Ched. Let's call him Ched. So Ched, <laughs> the king who had been controlling these city-states of the region, was conquering the nearby world. And so while he's away, there's five of these vassal kings, okay, that rebel. And they go into the towns, including Lot's town, and they uh, take spoils. And so then Ched, King Ched, he comes back and the, uh, drives the five rebel kings into hiding. And so then he goes and takes all the spoils from them, which includes Lot and Lot's family and all of Lot's herds. Okay. So then this king makes Lot a prisoner and he moves on. So then Abram here, he's not yet Abraham. Abram takes 318 trained warriors. He beats this king in battle and he takes Lot and the spoils back to Canaan with him. So it's at this time that this priest Melchizedek comes out to meet Abraham. Okay. Or he's Abram at this time. So he comes out to meet Abram to bless him. Okay. He brings out bread and wine. So who is this Melchizedek? <clears throat> and and, and we, we have more of an understanding here, um, at least some of us do. Maybe you've heard of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek has no recorded family. And if you know anything about the Jews, the Jews were all about genealogies, right? You can go through the Old Testament. You see all the genealogies. You see that genealogies of Levitical priesthood, they're all there. But yet Melchizedek has none, Okay, and so the author of Hebrews is, is contrasting this of that lineage-based priesthood of Aaron with Melchizedek, who there's no recorded birth or death of this priest. So um, this is where that discussion on Melchizedek gets really interesting, and there's many commentaries on this that go in different directions. Was he just a righteous man? Was he an apparition of Jesus in the Old Testament? This is called a theophany, right? Was an angel sent to govern the city of Salem? But the author's point here is none of these things. The author's point here, is he is more interested in showing off Jesus, Jesus's superior priesthood 
to these Hebrew, remember he's writing to Hebrews that are scattered, okay? He's writing to Hebrew Christians who are scattered. And, and if you've been with us in the book of Hebrews, they've been scattered and they've been wanting to go back to Judaism, right? And that's why there's so many warnings in Hebrews of don't go back to what God brought you out of. All these warnings of don't go back to these things, don't go back to these things, okay? And so he's telling them here, he's showing them Jesus, right? They're, he's pointing to Jesus is that he is, a, he is of the same, um, same priesthood as Melchizedek, okay? So this Melchizedek was a priest of God most high. He is the king of Salem. Salem means full, complete, safe, whole peace. We know that Salem peace, the author of Hebrews, calls attention to this, right? Melchizedek was the king of peace, and the ancient town of Salem later became known as Jerusalem. Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. The order of Melchizedek is royal and everlasting. We have the 110th Psalm is a messianic prophecy that tells us that the two things God promised to do for Jesus was make Jesus the king in Zion, make Jesus a priest. Psalm 110, 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the permanence of Melchizedek's priestly order is important to the author of Hebrews since Jesus is the resurrected great high priest of our new covenant. And this is what he's telling them, right? Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and greater than Aaron. So Melchizedek, greater than Abraham, so much so that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all his spoils. So if Abraham looked up to Melchizedek and Aaron looked up to Abraham, that puts the order of Melchizedek greater than Aaron's priesthood. This is what he's trying to tell them. <clears throat> and Melchizedek blesses Abram. And if you notice, right, Abram is returning from defeating the four kings and Melchizedek brings out bread and wine and he blesses Abram. And I want you to notice here, Melchizedek brought to Abram bread and wine. Interesting. The greater blessed the lesser. So before Abram honored Melchizedek with a tenth of his increase, Melchizedek blessed him with bread and wine. And we see that Jesus gave us bread and wine, right? He gave us his blood and his body before we gave anything back to him. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In a time where we did not deserve it, where we did not earn it, we could not work for it, God saved us. He died for us. Right? You know, and I think back in my life, and God, God uh, uh, I OD'd when I was 17, and God actually saved my physical life before I even submitted to him. And this is the kind of God that we serve. And not only did he save me, but he forgave me. He cleansed me. He made me a new creation. He made all things new, and he reconciled my life back to the Father. Things that I can never repay him for. And all this was, did on the, was done on the cross 2,000 years ago before I was even thought of. Before I was even a thought. That bread and wine is bread. That his body broken for us. His, his blood poured out for us so that one day our sins would be forgiven and we could be made whole. We could be made new. That Jesus gave us bread and wine on the cross. Yeah. Now what's important to note here is there's a tense change starting in verse 6. From past events to ongoing events. 
But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So now the writer goes from something in the past to something that is currently ongoing. Okay? And so he's talking about something, right? Something that's current, something that's continual. So these, these from six on is our only reference then has to be Christ. Christ lives not just to intercede on our behalf, but to continually bless us with bread and wine. <clears throat> he continually lives to do that, yeah. right? He didn't just do it on the cross. He gave us the bread and wine on the cross, and now he continually gives us the bread and wine, okay? He left us with that, the word and the Holy Spirit, Okay, so now we've got the bread, the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit, the wine. These are continually ongoing things now, continually ongoing in our life. The word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And the spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. He is our continual teacher, our continual comforter in a dark and sinful world. He keeps our feet firmly planted on the truth. And these things work together. The word and the spirit. These things work together, right? They're, these are beautiful gifts that work in conjunctions with one another, right? With, 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 if you have too much word without the spirit, it becomes legalistic, dry, and staunch. And then you get too much wine and you're drunk. Right? I mean, I, I got saved in a, in a, in a hyper Pentecostal church. I, I mean, that's just what I call it, a hyper Pentecostal church. And I praise God that I was introduced to all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I love that. But if you get too much into the spiritual with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you're not grounded by the word. It becomes a very emotional, feeling led experience. And if you're all word without the spirit, it's very staunch and dry and almost dead. Right, so, so we have these continual things of bread and wine, right? I always say it's like eating and exercise. They go together. You can't outrun a bad diet. <laughs> you can't. So, so he, he now is continually giving us these things, continually blessing us. So how can we not give back. If he continually blesses us, how can we not honor him? We are the less, he is the greater. He blesses the less so that then we can give back. We, he is wonderful beyond description. Wonderful beyond description. And his, his greatness is unsearchable. Yet he gives me his best gifts. And how can I not honor him by giving him back my everything? My body, my mouth, my praise, my worship, my obedience, my, my time, my money, my family, my children, my best gifts. As Abraham gave back to Melchizedek, Melchizedek blessed first, but Abraham honored him after he was blessed. For Samuel 2.30 says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. To honor God is to esteem him his due worth. And I want you to remember that. Honor means to esteem their due worth. It's a high estimation. It's respect. It's reverence. It's veneration. And honor is a manifestation of our respect and reverence to an awesome and almighty God. So how we honor him is a reflection of how much we respect him, how much we revere him. 
And honestly, it's saying, this is what I deem your worth, God. This is what I deem your worth. Here's a few ways to honor the Lord. The first thing is we honor the Lord by honoring his word. Yeah. Yeah. Acts 13, 48 says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. That word glorified is also translated honored. Okay, so they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. <clears throat> So like, like children that honor their parents by obeying them, we honor our heavenly father by our obedience to his word. That's how we show that we honor him, right? Christ was word became flesh. His life was an incarnate life, living out God's way perfectly. All his life, he obeyed God's will and exalted the words in the scriptures, and even at the threat of death, he ensured he fully fulfilled every word on earth. Therefore, honoring Christ naturally entails following his example and treating God's words seriously. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words never will pass away. We can lose our limbs and even our life, but we cannot disobey God's words. And if you want to you wanna see how much uh, uh, somebody loves and obeys and honors God's word, go read Psalm 119. Yeah, right. That's all David talked about was how much he loved God's word, how much he honored God's word, how much he obeyed God's word. It was his life, right? It's, it, it, that's where we get, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God, that's how we uh, honor God by obeying him. The next thing we do, we honor the Lord with our body. Amen. First Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness, and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. And 2 Timothy 2.21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So when we think about this, right, the Bible, the Bible says that our bodies of the temple of the Holy Spirit, how are we treating our temples? This is just about you right now. <clears throat> we'll get to how you treat others in a minute. <clears throat> But do we, do we treat it like a, a temple or a trash can? Because if, if, if it's the holy, if the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, and it says you are bought with a price, honor God and glorify him in your body. He's talking about the physical body. Are we honoring him in our physical body? That means like, what, what things are we wearing? <clears throat> Right? You know, and, and anybody's on Facebook, you can see, you know, uh, <clears throat> mostly women <clears throat> take selfies like this. <clears throat> and post a scripture. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how, how's, how's that honoring God? Right? Our bodies are for our spouses, and they're, they're to be covered until we have a spouse. Are we showing off parts that are meant for others? Are you yielding to sin or yielding to righteousness? And Paul told Timothy, flee lust and pursue righteousness and peace. Avoid strife. Do not quarrel. These things are dishonoring to God. That's when we talk about you should be, uh, uh, f be an honorable vessel when you get rid of what is dishonorable. It's okay. <clears throat> Next, honor the Lord with your words. <clears throat> Psalm 71, 8, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day long. Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So we say, what words are coming out of your mouth? 
You know, and people say, well, you know, I, I work in an area where everybody cusses. Well, that doesn't mean you have to. Foul, obscene, cruel words. These are not honoring to God. They're, they're not. Speaking truth or lies. What, what's honoring to God? Do we, do we speak edification or tearing down? <clears throat> With gossip and slander. These are not honoring to God. Are we seeking unity or division? Foul language or honoring language. Are you praising or complaining? You know, uh, the Lord spoke this to me uh, several years ago that he said, Crystal, when you complain, you are showing me you're not satisfied with my provision. Talking about a knife in the heart. And I was like, oh, Lord, please forgive me. I am not going to complain. Thank you, Lord. Because our words will either honor the Lord or dishonor him. When we honor others with our words, you honor God, but the same is also true. When we dishonor somebody else, we dishonor God. <clears throat> Next is honor the Lord by honoring his house. Ecclesiastes 5 1 says, Keep your foot, give your mind to what you are doing when you go, as Jacob to the sacred Bethel, to the house of God. Draw near to hear and obey is better than to give the sacrifice of fools carelessly and irreverently to, ign to ignorant to know that they are doing evil. Leviticus 19.30 says, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now, it was interesting in this reverence my sanctuary, um, according to the definition of the Jewish canon, for an Israelite not to come into the sanctuary when they were legally defiled, not to ascend the mountain of the house of God with a staff in his hand, with his shoes on his feet, in his working clothes, with the dust on his feet, or carrying bags of money about his person, not to spit in the sacred precincts or make them a thoroughfare. I thought some of those were interesting. You know, we, we kind of live in a, a, a different time and people come from work. And so it's like, it's not fitting to have to go home and change to come to church or, you know, and things like that. And, and I don't think that's the point. But, you know, I do want to uh, make a, a point here in <clears throat> Christ's reference, this last one, this last rule in Mark eleven sixteen, where he, he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he referenced this because he was not allowing them to use the house of God as a shortcut. They would cut through, you know, as a shortcut through. But, you know, I was thinking on this. Do we use God's house as a shortcut? And, and a shortcut is an accelerated way of doing or achieving something. Think about that for a minute. Lots of people come to the house of God for a shortcut. A way to do something, a way to achieve something. People come in peddling their wares, selling their things, come do this, recruiting for this, recruit their shortcut. I thought it was really good too. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> yes, this is a building, but it's our dedicated house of God. We come here to worship. We come here to praise. We come here to fellowship with God's holy people. It's sanctified holy ground because God is a holy God. And, and if God didn't care about church buildings and everything that went on around them and in them, I wonder why he would tell his people in Haggai, he said, thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, the people says the time has not come. The time is the Lord's house should be built. And the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you yourself to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but don't you, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. For you looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because my house is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. You know, and if you don't believe God cares about the church building, then you should stop praying over your own house. Stop asking God to bless your house. Stop asking God to give you a house to live in. Stop praying that. Because you don't believe in houses. (laughs) It sounds pretty dumb, right? Because we all believe that God cares about our home and our house. I remember uh, one year there was a big winter storm and I asked God to protect our house when there was branches falling all over the place. And I, I stayed up all night praying, asking God to, to protect our house. The neighbors had a, a tree fall on their house. This was several years ago before, the, before you guys moved in. It was before you guys moved in, Flint's. But another neighbor had a tree fall on their house and, and um, I woke up in the morning and there was not one single branch on my lawn. Not one branch And there was branches everywhere around me. And my property was clear. Don't tell me God doesn't care about our homes and our houses and our property. Do you respect the house of God? Are you constantly late to church? I'm not looking at anybody. And I don't mean once or twice, you know, it's not, you know, some people, you know, I mean, it, it's not, it's not, it's not bad to be late, but when it becomes a habit, when it becomes a habit, it's disrespectful. Would you disrespect the White House? Okay, man, you know what, maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> I knew that one was coming. We would not disrespect the White House. We would not disrespect the White House. We, we, uh, we visited the White House a few years ago. Um, I don't know, it was like five years ago or something maybe? Yeah, like five years ago. Summer of 2016, we visited the White House. And, um, you know, you, you, it's hard to get into the White House. I don't know if anybody's ever visited. You have to go through, you got to go, um, you have to write a letter that your senator has to okay it. Well, our senator didn't okay it, um, um, but we actually knew somebody that knew somebody that got us in at the last minute. It was great, but then you got to go through, um, literally the metal detectors you have to go through detected a, um, a gum wrapper that was in my husband's pocket, the, a metal gum wrapper. It detected his metal gum wrapper. That's how, I mean, we went through several things to go into the White House and we're going in the right, we're, we're in the White House and it's just neat, folks. I mean, it's a, it's a neat piece of history. Um, and, and, you know, we have respect for the White House because we have respect for things. And we were, uh, we were, we were going through the rooms and, and we went into the green room. Maybe you know, ever, ever heard of the green room or seen the green room? Well, they have this beautiful green wallpaper that's velvet green wallpaper that's on the walls. And it's, it's like old, it's super old. And I'm not paying attention. I'm just looking at this wallpaper and I'm like, man, this is neat looking. I'm just like this. And I'm like this. <laughs> I start doing this. I'm just like. Oh, it's soft. This is so neat. And my husband's over there, and there's a cop over here. And I didn't see the sign right here in front of me that says, please don't touch the wallpaper. And I'm, I'm just back here like this going, oh, the, his, the history in this thing. And the cops are, ma'am, don't touch the wall. Ma'am, don't touch the wall. And I, I'm not paying attention. I don't know who he's talking to. And he's all, ma'am, don't touch the wall. And I was like, me? Yeah, don't touch the wall. And I was like, I'm so sorry. And he's like, it's okay, it's just old. <laughs> he's like, and he's over there watching me the whole time laughing at me. <laughs> But you know, we, we, how do we not have respect for the house of God like that? How do we not have respect?
respect for the house of God. Just honor God's house. Honor God's house. Can you say the zeal for your house has consumed me? Notice what Jesus, uh, or honor the Lord by honoring his people. Notice what Jesus told Paul in Acts 9, 1 through 5. Said Saul, before he became Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now notice what Jesus said. Paul was persecuting people. Paul was persecuting Christians. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. What we do to other Christians, we do to Jesus. And this is the part where Jesus said, this is why we always say when he said he separated the sheep and goat, and he said, as much as you did to them, he did to me. He wasn't talking about the world. He was talking about his people. It's the same thing here. When we persecute his people, when we take care of his people or don't take care of his people, we do or don't or do or persecute Christ. When we persecute other Christians, we persecute Jesus. When we slander God's people, We're slandering Jesus. Think about that next time. When we don't do or what we do or do not do the things to God's people, we are not doing them or we are doing them to Jesus. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Remember, the less is blessed by the greater. Love keeps no records of wrongs. There are two kinds of pride. These are two faces of the same coin. Those who say, I have done nothing wrong, and those who say, I have wronged you, but you wronged me first. The first is always right, never wrong. They see themselves on high moral ground. And the second always has a justification for their behavior. Humility counts others greater than ourselves all the time. Outdo one another in honor. Next, honor your leaders and elders. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And this one's always so curious to me because, you know, um, in today's world with social justice and social gospel, the people that are honored the most are the ones that are out serving. And I'm not saying we're not supposed to honor people. We're supposed to honor all men. But they get the greater honor. And here it says that those that teach and preach the word are supposed to have a greater honor. And, and by my estimation, those that preach and teach the world are the scourge of the earth. <clears throat> the Christians are the ones that tell them to shut up, tone it down, stop preaching the word. A Christian should be seen and not heard. And we get scourged when the Bible says that they're supposed to have the greater honor. Ephesians 6, 2 through 3 says, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Honor your father and mother. There's no time limit on that. It doesn't say you have to always obey them. When, when, you, when you get married, you leave and cleave. <clears throat> but honor is give them that respect Leviticus 19.32 says, You shall stand before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. You shall fear God. I am the Lord. You know, teach your children respect for adults and authority. Man, you know, my, my grandmother, man, woo! 
I, would, I got slapped for disrespect. I got a crisp one right across the face for talking back for disrespect. You know, and maybe I'm old school, plus I'm from Texas, you know, but I, <laughs> I, was, I was taught that, that my pastor, his first name was Pastor. And, and, it's, and it's not because he wanted me to call him that. It's because it's a title of respect. And I respected the man of God. I respected my grandparents. I never called my grandparents by their first name. And I'm going to tell you, if you have young kids, I don't like young kids calling me by my first name. I'm just telling you right now, I don't like it. I am, I am not your friend. I am not your peer. I can be friendly to you. And I will love on you. But don't call me by my first name. Call me ma'am. And, and, you know, uh, we've lost this in society, though. There's no respect for authority. There's no respect for our elders. We don't teach these things to our children. I, I can't tell you how many kids have come up, you know, when I say something, and they say, I don't have to do that. You're not my mom. I'm like, you better be glad I ain't your mom. <laughs> I don't have to obey you. I see what you're saying when you're in prison, kid. All right. And lastly, I would be remiss in not talking about this. Honor the Lord with your tithes. This scripture is about tithes. It's about tithing. Abraham paid tithes after he was blessed. And the scripture tells us there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. He's talking about Christ. So he's talking about that Christ as high priest always makes intercession for us in the heavenly realms. And so therefore he receives everything from us continually. So if he receives everything from us, so whatever, whatever however he receives tithes, However, he's receiving that, we, we, we are uh, to continually do that. That's why I brought up after verse 6, it, it goes on to a continuation of things. The, the, the verb changes, the tense changes. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, you don't have to tithe. You also don't have to stay faithful to your spouse. But you're going to eat the actions. You'll eat the fruit of your consequences. You, you are free to choose what you want to do, but we're not ever free from the consequences of those choices. The tithe is a tenth of our increase. And it's for the storehouse. It's the place where you're fed the word of God. This was God's design all along. Now, it's you have it's your, your increase. And I have to say that because my son used to believe that he had to give a tenth of his income every week. Even if he didn't get paid. Whatever money he had, he gave a tenth. Next week, whatever money he had, he gave a tenth. And so, he, you know, as a kid, you don't get paid very much. And so he's given a tenth of all of his money, you know, as we taught him from a young age to give, a, to give a tenth of his money. The tithe means a tenth. And God says where the tithe goes. We don't get to determine that. God tells us where the tithe goes. Offerings are free will offerings to give as you are led, but the tithe goes to God's house. That's how it's set up. And, and you know, um, first of all, I'm just done arguing with people about tithing. Yeah. If you don't want to tithe, don't talk to, don't, don't tell me why you don't want to tithe. I'm just done arguing with people about it. I've been serving God for 27 years now. I, mean, I think I'm going on 28 in March. But I, I have, um, in, in all of my years, I've never not tithed. And I've never not been fully taken care of the whole time. But I will tell you, I have watched people that started out tithing 
and over time. Now, it didn't happen automatically, but over a long period of time, they went from an abundance to barely getting by. I've seen it time and time again. I can, I can name you countless people that I have watched that happen in their finances. Because God's word is tried and true. His principles are eternal. You know, and um, I, I've, just, I've just never not tithed. And, and listen, we don't, the church does not need your money, okay? God supplies abundantly. He does. God supplies abundantly. He supplies abundantly, okay? I am just telling you, first of all, prophetically, that this is going to be of the utmost importance in the next coming years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good. There's, some, there's some things coming, and um, I, 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 prosperity, pr- prosperity is going to be for those people of God who are generous yeah. Yeah. in their giving. And they're going to be completely blessed. And you're going to watch other people that are not. I've seen things. Um, I, I, I've seen things that are coming. I don't want to get too much into that. I don't have a lot of time. But um, it's going to be of the utmost importance, folks. Okay? This is not about being legalistic. It's about honoring God. And, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how we cannot honor God with, with, with our wealth when he has been so so, so good to us. And I'm like, all he wants is a 10th. Woo. He don't even want, he, he don't even ask me to give it all to him. If he did, I'd gladly give it all to him. But he just said, just, just give me, give me a 10th. Just give me a 10th. Right. And, and you can ask anybody, um, that, that's been a Christian for a long time and, and people, this is one of the places where God said to test him. And when people step out in faith and test God in their finances and they test God in, in giving him the 10th, man, God just blows things wide open. I've watched people have an abundance of money. I've watched them have promotions when they stepped out in, in faith and tithing. I've watched it. And I'm just like, man, it is, a, it is a complete miracle to me because God's finances just don't make sense in the natural. Never. Okay, so don't think I'm sitting here telling you, you need to tithe, you're going to hell, you know, I mean, uh, and, and we're, we're not trying to get rich, nobody's trying to get rich here. I want you to be blessed. Yes. And honoring the things that the Lord tells us to honor, we commend Christianity to those living outside of God. Because people are watching us and they're judging us. And their eyes and their tongues are there ready to pounce and accuse us. And we want to give them no reason for false accusations so that we may freely stand before God uncondemned. God honors us when we honor him. And these are just a few ways to honor God. Angie's played... These are just a few ways to honor God. You can find all sorts of ways in scripture to honor God, but these are just a few. I just want to give you an opportunity tonight to respond to the message. If there's something that spoke to you, then pray about it. Give it up to God. If there's a, if there's a worry or a concern in the area, maybe, maybe you haven't been honoring God uh, in, with your mouth or with your body. Just Just ask for forgiveness and say, Lord, show me how to honor you in this and teach me in this. Uh, The Lord is our, uh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our guide, he's our comforter. And he will teach us the good and right, right, honorable way. And as you're responding to that, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about things, if you're here tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus I want to give you an opportunity to meet him. The Holy Spirit is here. The Lord said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. As we lift up the name of the Lord, he begins drawing men's hearts to him. If he's drawing on your heart tonight, and you don't know what to do, all you, all you have to do is say, Lord, please forgive me. Draw me near to you. 
Save me from my sins. Save me from myself. Just receive his gift. Receive that beautiful gift of salvation. Let him wash you. Let him make you whiter than snow. Let him make you a new creation in Jesus Christ. You don't have to go get right. He'll make you right. Just stop and surrender to him. If that's you and you would like someone to pray for, pray for you, pray with you, just raise your hand. I'll send someone to you to pray with you. Maybe you've been far away from God. You're a prodigal. Been out living life on your own and you know, you know what you need to be doing. Just stop. Just come to your senses. Say, Lord, I'm done running. He's waiting. Just run back to the Father. For the rest of us, let's just make a commitment to honor God this year with our lives, with our bodies, with our mouths. with our money, with our gifts, with our family. Let us be people that no man can find accusation in us, but only false. Lord, give us strength for this year, God. Give us courage for this year, Father. Let us honor you with our lives. Let us honor you with our bodies. Let us honor you with our mouths. Let us honor one another, Father, and prefer others greater than ourselves, Father. Because you have blessed us so greatly, Lord. Father God, we just give you praises and glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you so much for being online with us today. I want to remind you, if you're not a follower on Facebook, please like our page on YouTube. Please subscribe. Follow us on Twitter. Tell all your friends. Continue to watch online. We thank you for watching. We love you so much. Have a great day.